Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the Linux Lads. I am always as uh, Shane. Um, who are you guys? I am Mike. I'm Connor. And we are the Linux Lads. Um, it's good to be back. January. I hope everyone's nicely stuffed, full of turkey and things that are bad for them. <laughs> uh, Mike, what did you get up to over the holidays? Oh, I've been up to many a thing, but uh, most uh, recently I've installed uh, Pop! OS on my work PC and uh, uh, straight GNOME on my Arch install, and uh, I'll be talking about that in a little while. Nice. Connor? Um, not much, not much at all. And just so we were doing our own version of the Ubuntu podcast going off for curry, we went over to Mike's house for fondue, so that might be our thing. It's very classier. Yeah, it's your, yes, you guys are always welcome back. <laughs> so uh, I think we'll move it swiftly along, segueing as always, even into 2019. Um, so first on the agenda, GNOME, Pop! OS. Mike, you mentioned that. So everybody knows me as a fanatical user of KDE who will never, ever stray from the path and uh, that's exactly what I did. I went to board one day and just decided to reinstall my work work PC, uh, install Pop! OS, which is uh, a Ubuntu 18.10 uh, with uh, a customized version of GNOME on the top. It looks really good from the box, out of the box. It uh, is, uh, it is, uh, uh, aimed at developers uh, by the people who make the System76 laptop and uh, laptops and desktops over in the United States is as a workstation it's uh, really nice it kind of has got the gnome vibe where you get into the zone and you just start working and you do your own thing and the system gets out of your way having said that it has got a few gnome specific snags as well so out of the box, I don't remember if I had to install it or if it was there, but basically, uh, and I think Connor had spoken about this before in a previous episode, GNOME is uh, basically useless without the top icons plus extension for me, because you can't see status icons. You can't see if somebody, you know, you can't see your uh, Telegram icon and you can't see your uh, Mattermost icon. So if that wasn't there, that would be a big problem for me. And that's an extension. And it's no longer maintained either because the developer, I think, got really annoyed at the way GNOME was forcing him to work. So he just quit. And um, that's that's one, that's, that's possibly the worst thing about it. The, then uh, there are a few things that are GNOME specific, like that uh, uh, if you want to have the normal three buttons on the top of the screen, that's also an extension. Otherwise, that's just the close down button. But that's a design choice. I get that. Uh, the same for icons on the desktop that I think are actually there by uh, by default because Pop, uh, System76 installed some extensions by default. Uh, so this might be there and it's not in stock GNOME. But uh, I get all those design choices where basically they are saying, well, we, we, we think that this is how people would like to work. That's why we are doing it this way, with the exception of those top icon plus, top, of, of those status bar icons, because that's, I don't think it's, it's uh, usable without it. Um, I hit some dual monitor troubles where, uh, because one of them is a VGA and the other one is a display port, uh, it kind of, uh, it kind of uh, thinks that uh, they are uh, basically, it, even though one is at its primary, it thinks that the other one is turned on first or something. So there's a bit of a problem with switching, but I think I'm on uh, going to sort it out. Uh, the nice things, I really like the way it's integrated. If you if you have got a Google Drive, as I have to have for work, you just type your password into GNOME and it will mount the drive as a web dev, I think. The same for Nextcloud. You can install the Nextcloud app, but you can also just uh, use from GNOME files or aka Nautilus. The, uh, you can use, you can use it as a uh, network mount. Uh, it's uh, really beautiful uh, with the exception of Firefox. For some reason, uh, everything, some forms are dark letters on dark background. So I don't know. Uh, that doesn't work very well, but everything else is pretty good. Um, 
I've been talking for five minutes. Maybe somebody else should. Otherwise, this will be really boring. <laughs> now, what, what I was going to say is just a, a couple of points that you have uh, raised. Yeah, the um, the top icons plus um, for legacy icons is definitely um, definitely um, um, a necessity. Um, there is a handy thing on GNOME, which is the online accounts. So it's just one place you log into online accounts. It will say... If you want to log into your Google account, if you want to log into your Nextcloud account, if you want to log into your uh, Microsoft or Exchange account or whatever, you literally bang in your username and password in there and then your calendar is synced to wh- whatever that account is, whether it's your Nextcloud account or your Google account or your Microsoft account is your calendar, your mail, uh, all of that just get all with the default apps. So th- th- um, that's quite useful. Um, anytime that I, I had been using GNOME in the past and I was like, hmm, because we, we do have um, Next uh, Nextcloud ourselves where we kind of change share files amongst ourselves or um, documents and that sort of thing. Um, and quite recently I was trying out, um, Ubuntu 1804, uh, no, Ubuntu 1810 actually, which is known by default. And then I was like, hmm, online accounts, Nextcloud. I'll try this. And it just logged in what makes Nextcloud account. And then there, right there and then in uh, Nautilus, it just mounted. And I was like, oh, this is kind of, this is kind of cool. Um, I like that design choice. But yeah, um, certain things that you kind of have to, Denomify it or de gnomify um some of their choices and it pop os and the ubuntu team in in canonical do um some of those little things just to make it more user friendly the vanilla gnome i don't really like yeah but it's a bit telling that uh both of the of these uh organizations choose to add some extension they also install the gnome tweak and definitely in pop os and i think in stock ubuntu is also installed by default because otherwise you have not many customization options uh, and um, uh, no gnome, gnome, gnome tweak is not installed by default in, in ubuntu as far as I'm aware. Oh, okay but it's but it is on pop os and uh oh maybe uh, yeah, list, listeners those, feel free yeah. to correct me on that but that's my understanding uh yeah so it's it is on one side i understand it i get it like i actually started using gnome at work because i was watching somebody giving a presentation on their mac os uh, device or mac os 10x whatever and uh, i was just looking at at the screen and, and the person was controlling the uh, the computer with what I can just describe as grace because it was, it's just there. It's so easy to, uh, to manipulate the windows and everything is on there. So I was thinking, well, GNOME always felt that way. So, uh, that's, that's why I, that's why I switched. And to the most part, it definitely feels that way. And just like Mac OS 10, there are things that they won't let you customize and that there are also things that you think that should be should should be working differently and they are just not gonna because it's an just like OS ten, it's an opinionated desktop environment. Yeah, um so this is what I have been up to. I've uh, got a brand new microphone which you're listening to me on at the moment, uh the audio interface. I was having intermittent um sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't work um under any kind of linux whether it's ubuntu undergoes whatever um with the the interface and then troubleshooting and then off their website they just said windows driver so and like i get like i was spent hours trying to troubleshoot it um so i kind of gave up and started dual booting just for the sake of i was like this is my new microphone. This is my new toy. I want to try it out. So at the moment, yes, I am using the Devil Spawn OS coming from Redmond, Washington, um, to record to record this at the moment. Um, but it uh, from um somebody who I use Windows Ten at work. Um, but obviously I prefer to use Linux as my main operating system. So coming from a Linux user's point of view, um, how did I find the Windows Ten? Uh, approach my approach to Windows 10 so obviously I did a brand new install and um, some people who who get it as part of their OEM install might have a different experience than this this was me complete wipe so during the installation 
it obviously heavily encourages you to sign in with a Microsoft account. But if you go to the bottom left, I believe there, you you kind of have to dig dig through it. It's not immediately obvious, but there is a way of doing an offline local only account. Strongly suggest you do that. That means that most of the metrics are not being sent off because it's not an online Microsoft account. Um, during the installation, there's is like do you want to do the express install or advanced i strongly recommend you do the advanced install uh, and then you're to- literally going no 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 toggling off loads of shit next no 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 next no 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 next uh, and then as soon as you inst- you um have your brand new desktop your start menu is absolutely massive it's half of it is filled up with freaking candy crush and uh, Xbox freaking live tiles and weather. Well, weather, I suppose, is useful, but it's, uh, so the first thing I do is like just go in and it literally, it, it takes a while, but it can be done. You just go in, just right click on all of those live tiles, what they call them, and just go right, right click, unprint from start menu, right click, unpin from start menu. There's about freaking 25 of them by default, but if you do that, um, you're the with the start menu shrinks down completely and it's much much easier um candy crush is installed by default so uninstall that shite um x the xbox app is inst- installed by default and cannot be uninstalled and same with skydrive um which is annoying i believe there's registry hacks to get around that but it's literally not even through the interface you if you're in the uninstall section of the of the um system settings and you right click on it the the uninstall will either won't be there or it will be grayed out um so it's almost impossible unless you go into the registry to uninstall all this shite Again, I've been ranting on for about five minutes, <laughs> but one th- one final thing is I will say Shut Up 10 is a third party app that literally goes in and he toggles most of these for you. Um, unfortunately, Windows Update sometimes reverses these things, but then if you open up Shut Up 10 again, it will say, oh, these have been reversed. You want to re-toggle them and get rid of them. And I think Shut Up 10 will, will um, disable SkyDrive if you don't like that appearing on, in your right-click menus or whatever, contextual menus. Okay, take a breath. And <laughs> you, you guys, <laughs> feel free to jump in. Yeah, it was just like... When you met, when we mentioned Windows 10, I was like, "Oh God, uh, I haven't actually used Windows 10 in, a, in probably over a year." Um, it's and I I don't know like that. I consider that a good thing, like because a very good thing. I yeah because it, I just find that you know the I don't do very intensive things on my computer, uh, like and I don't really play games that often, so. That's kind of, you know, there was a video editor I used to uh, use before, but and that only worked on Windows. But then I kind of discovered Linux applications, so it just replaced that, you know. So, um, you know, the, I, I can understand the draw of Windows sometimes. Like, as much as we love Linux, as evidenced by my sound issues before this, uh, this, this ep- we began recording this episode, um, yeah, Linux can be fussy when it wants to be so you know sometimes when your back's against the wall sometimes you kind of need to just go you know dance with the devil it's uh it's not nice and we, i wish we wish we didn't have to do it sometimes but unless we have the skills like advanced linux troubleshooting skills um which i do not uh i can copy and paste commands from websites <laughs> and put them paste them into a terminal but beyond that you know, I can only do so much. So if I just need it to work, sometimes you gotta go to Windows. Yeah, but now we are all shitting ourselves that Connor's computer is gonna restart an update for the next half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, I, I really wish this audio interface um, did. I mean, as I said, I am dual booting. So um, one time I was, and the other version on the other part of my hard drive is um, Ubuntu eighteen ten. Remember, I was talking about my Gnome adventures. So that's what I've been doing. Was I was experimenting on Gnome on on the other side of my hard drive as well. Um, but um, so one time I was I was in there and 
I was just messing around and then I was I brought up Audacity and I was like, wait, it's actually detecting this microphone. So as I said, it's kind of in, it's 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 intermittent. Um, so who knows? This microphone actually, um, maybe a later later kernel update or something might have reactivated the 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 um the compatibility or something. So I'm perfectly willing to just wipe it, wipe Windows and go back and see what's the story. But um, yeah, these are kind of my adventures in Windows so far. Well, I the way I see it, say the problem is that we don't have that kind of uh, rich ecosystem of applications that are created that are aimed at people who want to do something without knowing much about how it works technically. We have a lot of applications on on Linux for experts or for uh, like programmers and sysadmins, but if I wanted to just by myself record audio and make it sound good without me not even having the ears for it. There is uh, no such thing that can do it for me because Audacity, to me, just looking at Audacity is like looking into a cockpit of a space shuttle. I don't know what these buttons do and I'm worried to press anything in case it explodes and fly off. So (laughs) I think... (laughs) And I hope that with the recent developments and like, uh, you know, getting more games and getting more developers and getting everybody into the Linux ecosystem, even though we are sacrificing a bit of the uniqueness because we are getting all the electron apps and stuff, but hopefully there will be soon enough users for companies and uh, like small development shops to justify the expense and develop these little tools for Linux that, that we might not have to run Audacity, which is actually an expert tool. And it's a great expert tool, I'm sure, but it's not, it's not made for me. Maybe just something that has got a simple record button and with some very sane defaults that I can just press and it will record and then I press stop and it will stop and save it as something then, then can Shane can cut up and, uh, you know, put together. So. That's yeah. That's what I think. About. Yeah, Shane. Um, what, no, what I was going to going to say was, it's not all negative. I mean, I I'm perfectly willing to, to point out the positives in anything that I see. Um, so the positive things that I, I noticed, just I'm sure there's a lot more than this, but these are the ones that stood out to me. Is it actually does have a good design, but then again, they're big, massive corporation. They have a dedicated design team, so the the kind of pixel perfect um design and refinement and things like that that you're you're go- you're going to expect from Microsoft, and you're going to expect that from Apple with um, their Mac OS as well. Um, there are um. The design, some design teams on, on Linux, uh, like the KDE design team and the GNOME design team, um, I, I may not agree with their aesthetics 100% of the time, but they're approaching that, um, getting close to that, but just wind, window, or the Windows team on, on, um, or the Microsoft team, with the Windows on Microsoft, um, <laughs> I'll get there eventually. Um, they, just yeah they just have the resources to just say okay these we have a dedicated design team and and maybe they they have 20 people on that team where um it might only be one or two dedicated people on gnome or or, or whatever maybe a team of five i i do not know the insides of any of these um corporations so these are wildly spec wildly speculating right hold on you actually like the way windows 10 looks yeah i like i actually do um, but no, no, I can I can get the design behind it because to me I I to, no to be frank I actually don't work with it but I have to look in at it uh, when I when when you know we work with a colleague or something and uh, just it looks to me that there are some very modern ideas and some ideas from uh, 1990 and everything in between squashed together in uh, you know there's a lot of legacy stuff and a lot of it still looks like Windows 95. And I, I don't think there is like you know you you look at Apple and you know or GNOME or KDE and you know there is a de- design philosophy. Uh, Windows always looked disjointed to me, like that there was something, but uh, it, it wasn't. It didn't matter as long as it was functional. And that's not necessarily. I sound like I'm slagging them. That's not necessarily a slag. That's a. That's just me saying that I think they have got different priorities over there, like making work, every making everything work rather than just uh, make it look pretty. I mean, I've I've said several times on this podcast, I I like cinnamon because it reminds me of Windows, and I don't mean that in a, in a, as a 
a detriment to cinnamon at all. In fact, I think it's a compliment. It's just, just the fact that this is the way my brain works. I'm expecting the taskbar to be at the bottom. I'm expecting a, a, a menu that pops up with a search functionality. That's just the way my brain works. And um, I tend to get frustrated and um, for I'm trying to find stuff if if it's not in that in those places I'm not saying I can't li- I mean as I said I've, I've used GNOME and GNOME is completely the opposite um, so I can't use other things it's just just sometimes when you're tired and you just want things where you expect them to be um, so I think that's the unfortunate thing of having grown up with the Windows um, usage paradigm all the way through 95, 98, or Windows 7 and so on. Um, It's just cinnamon just reminds me of that. So when I was uh, back on Windows 10, as I said, once I reduced the menu down and got rid of half the Candy Crush shite that's on it, it's it's perfectly usable as user interface. I mean, putting aside the privacy concerns and putting aside the the fact that you don't think it's it's very efficient and Linux is way more efficient on hardware, which I I would happen to agree agree with. As I said, I I want to be back on Linux. I don't want to be on Windows Ten. It's just the fact that um for it's the the freaking driver for my uh, audio interface, um. And as I said, I, I'm dual booting and I'm constantly experimenting. So sometimes when I'm dual booting and I'm, I'm on my Linux partition, I might find that bang, uh, la- the latest update of whatever kernel it is, bang, now my audio interface is working and I could completely wipe it and wipe Windows and go just Linux full time. So this, this is just me just speaking objectively and saying I like the way that Windows is designed. Um, I, I'm not saying do I think it's perfect far from it there are there is a lot of legacy sh- shit in there that just doesn't make any sense and there's things that i prefer on cinnamon than i do on windows 10 as i said i use windows 10 in in work constantly and it'll be constantly uh, there's little things that will frustrate the shit out of me about the design of windows 10 but it's just the basic uses paradigm of the start the start menu and being able to hit the Windows key or the super key and just start typing and 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 my eye just naturally goes down to the bottom left when I'm doing that. Um, I'm not saying you you can't hit the the Windows key or the super key on GNOME and start typing. Of course you can, and it's right there in front of you. But it's just um, yeah, it's little things. As I said, it's it's entirely subjective. Yeah. Um, I mean, I totally agree with you on the uh, taskbar front. Um, it just makes sense to me. Uh, maybe that's just a pattern that's been embedded into my brain just from my childhood using Windows. But yeah, whatever it is, that's that's what I like to. Um, I think we have talked about Windows for about 15 minutes of this Linux podcast. So <laughs> I think we shall move on to some Linux distro news. Um, Mike, do you want to start us off there? Oh, yeah, sure. So Fedora 30, which is uh, the next release, I believe. Shit, I just forgot. Anyway, let's say it is for the purposes and intensities of this discussion. They are going to get a Deepin desktop option. Now, you can install Deepin now, I think, but it's gonna. they are just going to make it official. Uh, Deepin is known to be basically sexy as fuck, and that's great because... <laughs> We we need that in in the Linux uh, ecosystem. It's uh, it comes from for those who do not who do not who do not know, it comes from the Deepin uh, distribution out of China. Uh, that uh, is also I think based it's based on Ubuntu and it's known to just look amazing. They take a little bit uh, from it's the based Mac. on Debian, isn't it? Debian, um, you see. I, th- I'm, I think I'm it's really... I think I think it's a snapshot of Debian testing, but. Or is it Sid or something? I'm really good at spreading misinformation today. Uh, thanks for, for thanks for catching this. Uh, anyway, uh, so basically, they 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 look really good. They take good care into uh, making things uh, look so like pleasant to the eye and modern, uh, with bit bit of the macOS wipe. And uh, we will soon be able to install it on Fedora or get Fedora with uh, with it like properly official. So you could say you could be diving deep in Fedora. Uh, uh. Oh no, you didn't. You were just waiting for like a week to unleash that one, weren't you? Yes. 
Speaking of Deepin, um, Deepin it's itself the actual uh, main project, not just the user interface. Well, I suppose it's the user interface, but it's coming from the Deepin project. Deepin um, 15.9 is now released with touchscreen support. So uh, all of you people out there with your touchscreen laptops or your um, tablets or tablet vertible, ver- tablet convertibles or whatever, tab vertibles, um, <laughs> you just invented a new hard drive category. <laughs> uh, yeah. So touchscreen support is is pretty interesting, uh, especially since, uh, as you said, Deepin is, uh, is sexy as fuck. It's just, from an aesthetic point of view, it's just really well designed. So this this is actually pretty cool because this is like something I was thinking of pretty recently was um, I'd love to find, I, I don't even, like, it should be possible, but I just don't know where to find them. Get an x86 tablet from China or something and uh, put Linux on it, put a, a full fat Linux uh, distro on it. But the touchscreen support was something I wasn't sure about. So uh, is it not, is it just Deepin or obviously there should be others? I mean, I'm assuming Ubuntu, Unity and whatnot has that. Uh, Gnome is uh, meant to be touch friendly because of the big icons and the dashboard that goes all over the screen. So it's reminiscent of like your mobile operating system. And it's easily to touch up rather than the, say, KD or Cinnamon menu in the, in the bottom corner where you would need basically a stylus to, to touch it even in a, on bigger screens. But, uh, I think there are specifically, uh, mobile, uh, for well, basically, there are now uh, user interfaces being made f- specifically for the small mobile screens. So maybe some kind of a spin off of that, like Plasma Mobile, might also be um, good for a tablet if you get one. If you are getting one, I think unlike PCs where everything pretty much works with the Windows tablets because they would come with Windows, uh, one has to be quite careful if he, if you, if it's even possible to install Linux because I know like people would want to do that on the Surface tablets and I know it's possible on the original one, but I'm not sure if it's possible on all of them. Yeah, your mileage may vary on Surface tablets. I, um, I think as long as the, um, the whatever the generic Chinese tablet x86 tablet that you buy, as long as it's pretty much just off the shelf Intel parts and it's pretty standard stuff, I think the you it should be okay. But if they're doing kind of real kind of custom stuff, and I don't mean custom stuff as expensive, sometimes it's just whatever the parts they have lying around or whatever parts the factory nearby them can can. Um, give them in in large quantities rather than uh, ordering shit from um, America. Um, so sometimes you might get weird hardware combinations in some in those tablets. Um, but if it's just basically Intel everything, then it should be fine. Yeah. So um, we'll move on to uh, Chrome OS to add a uh, app search to its launcher. Um, now that's interesting, actually. Um, what is a Chrome OS actually based on? Uh, Gen two. Fucking hell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, Which you know, was my first reaction to that as well, was, well, maybe not, maybe not fucking hell, but... Um, was, no, I mean, go, fucking hell, way to, spe- way to, way to spoil Gen 2, right? <laughs> uh, as someone who's never used Gen 2, I can't really comment, but it's the kind of I thing... I tried once. Uh, uh, this kind it of thing... Didn't uh, go well. It's the kind of thing of... Um, it doesn't Gen two already have its own package manager and isn't apt like De- uh, Debian and Ubuntu? Uh, why are you already using a Debian and Ubuntu package manager on Gen two? <laughs> yeah, but uh, the thing is that uh, I don't think Google allow access to the Gen two tools. They based off their distribution. They best they based Chrome OS off uh, Gen two, but I don't think you can use uh, was it Portage or whatever they call it. Uh, you ca- you are only confined to the uh, Chrome store to install software, and that's basically extensions for the browser. So you get. As far as I know, you get just uh, just whatever runs in Chrome. Plus, so this thing where you can install Linux applications and you can, uh, you know, they've been headed in this direction for a while now where you can basically get proper, in quotes, uh, uh, applications on the glorified browser operating system. Uh, that is a good thing, I think, because A, you give more people better tools. You, you, 
I mean, you know, you can uh, think of what you want about GIMP, but compared to some uh, <laughs> browser extension, it's always going to be more powerful. And they are giving Linux tools or tools that are primarily based on Linux into the hands of people who would never come across it. So I, I think it's a positive thing. Don't necessarily like Google, wouldn't ever buy a Chrome OS uh, device because why? But uh, I, I like that they are doing this. I think it's a good idea in the overall grand scheme of things. Yeah. Um, next thing on the agenda there is, uh, oh my God. I, yeah, I heard about this one during the week and uh, I talked about it with someone in work at length. It's uh, DuckDuckGo are using Apple Maps as their map provider. So when you search for maps on DuckDuckGo, it will serve you Apple Maps. Um, apparently, a little bit of a workaround. I don't know where I heard this, but... Uh, oh it yeah, was I, was, in, I think it was in, in the Telegram. In, in Telegram, you, yeah. Yeah, if you switch to the dark theme, DuckDuckGo, they're still using OSM. Um, so they obviously haven't made that switch in the in the in the thing. I don't know, <laughs> but the um, but yeah, that that's that's interesting because I was talking to a guy in work, like a diehard Apple guy, uh, follows all the conferences, all the keynotes, and he he kind of convinced me. Like he he said that this is uh, he said that Apple Maps actually have a far better security and privacy record than Google, and. I, I'd need to look into that a bit more before I believe them. But, uh, you know, they have other problems as well that I don't like. But, uh, yeah, maybe he has a point. Like, maybe Apple Maps is slightly better in the privacy dimension than uh, Google is. Uh, I mean, I've heard uh, Steve Gibson, is it his name? Well, basically, I heard it on security podcasts from people who have got security reputation talking about how Apple is better than Google in privacy. And of course, the business model also, like Apple sells you overpriced stuff, Google is selling your data. That's how they make money. So, But the problem here wasn't that they would be replacing Google with uh, with Apple Maps. They are replacing OSM, as far as I know, OpenStreetMap. You know, we had that on uh, two episodes back. And that's a that, to me, is a step in the wrong direction. Now, because you... At least from my point of view, I don't know how be- how much better or worse Apple Maps are than uh, than OpenStreetMap, but privacy-wise, OpenStreetMap is always going to be better. Oh yeah, no question. But but it's like if you're going to dance with the devil, which devil do you dance with? That's oh yeah, no, what that- I was going for. Apple probably. Like yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I would, I would I, agree. I, I, I would agree. Um, Apple tend to be more privacy f- um, facing because it's just for the basic thing, as as Shane was saying, is Apple sell you, you physical hardware products um, as services a bit as well with their iCloud and all that malarkey. But it's ma- basically where they make their money is physical hardware products, whereas uh, Google, it's your information that they're selling to advertisers. That's how they make their money. So um, Apple tend to be more um, privacy respecting. I know they had that iCloud leak a few years ago, but other than that, I'm not sure. Yeah, but I think that was that they got hacked rather than uh, rather than con- consciously sold your information or their customers' information. Uh, so, like, yeah, I mean, um, the the thing is, I would rather see them uh, using OpenStreetMap, but just I don't know how they make money. Uh, how, I, I know how they make money because Connor share, shared in the Telegram the uh, the chart where they showed, but I don't think they are making enough, and that this is probably why they have to sign a deal with uh, with one of the bigger ones so that they can make more money, and uh, so that we can keep having a you uh, keep having a search engine, uh, yeah, search engine. Um, what essentially is the um they broke down their their revenue model is they they do sell advertisements but they're not targeted advertisements in other words if you um go and duck duck go and you search for uh, a washing machine and of course it's going to result result in um results saying um a Wikipedia article about washing machines or whatever but beside it will be ads of from Amazon saying, do you wish to um, uh, purchase a washing machine? And it's literally just returning the result um, of your, or it's just sending off the your exact search term or whatever and the keywords to advertisements. It's not the, and then if you go back and then um, like the example that they gave is, is that is not being tracked. So if 
they contrasted it with Google and sometimes they'll say then Google's autocomplete. So God, it will start to form an opinion about you. In other words, um, if you do the same thing with Google, I've never do- I haven't done this, so this is just off the top of my head, but it'll say want to buy a and then it might say washing machine if it was Google because it's already aware of your previous search term. Whereas um, DuckDuckGo doesn't track any of that. It will just want to buy a and it will just do random results. Yeah, and they won't uh, they won't uh, sell your information to the highest bidder. Yeah, I, I am sad about them not using OpenStreetMap, but I understand that they have to make a living. So it's it's hard. It's in this stupid uh, advertising supported economy. So yeah, obviously I prefer they use uh, OpenStreetMap, but um, with Apple Maps, uh, yeah, as you said, it could be just a financial thing. But um, I'm I'm also curious with uh, Apple's. Uh, you know, Apple. How, what do Apple stand to gain? And I was kind of thinking that maybe it's good for Apple because they're they're basically just taking a dump in Google's backyard because that's that's their competitor. So uh, I know Google doesn't really have anything to do with this, but yeah, I I think you know them. You know, maybe they're just trying to find that find their partners kind of because Google has a lot of shit wrapped up in terms of search. Can I can I just uh, just one last thing, just one more thing uh, for hey, people hey. obvious. Yeah, for people who want to keep using DuckDuckGo and OpenStreetMap without having to switch to the dark team, you can just do bang or exclamation point, as we call it in Europe, OSM, and then you search them and it will still use uh, OpenStreetMap uh, for the search rather than uh, Google Apps, Google Maps, uh, sorry, Apple Maps. Yeah, I think we should call on everyone to do that. Just let's just fl- flood, flood DuckDuckGo with like not using Apple Maps. If you want to, I guess. So um, the next one item on our list is Purism are going to create a store for their mobile and PC operating systems, which I uh, is an interesting proposition. I didn't even know they were working on this, but as soon as they heard it, I'm like, yep, that sounds like a good thing. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's pretty cool, actually, because it means the project is getting a bit more real. Um I saw a, a brief screenshot and uh, it looked a brief screenshot. <laughs> I got a brief glance of a screenshot and uh, yeah, it looked very Android like, I have to say, like not a huge departure from, from the status quo in terms of UI anyway, but there was very little in the screenshot, I guess. So remains to be seen. Yeah, I hope uh, they take it. Uh, they take it off the ground, and I hope there will be a third uh, alternative to, uh, you know, iOS and uh, Google. Uh, having store is the one thing, and it's obviously important. Having something to fill the store with is uh, another matter. So, I ideally, and this is just probably me wishful thinking. Definitely, I've never heard anybody suggesting this from them. But ideally, I would see that you can install, and I don't know if it's possible, you could install Android apps via the store as well. Or maybe maybe not necessarily the Google Play ones, but maybe you could, if it could, if the, yeah, like, like, like Android. Yeah, like if you could use uh, F-Droid repositories or, yeah, uh, just sideload APKs through the store because uh, that's going to be the the thing in the success of the of the pure, uh, of the Librem phone is is it going to have applications? Um, one thing I was going to want to say is uh, I think it's called Anbox and it was developed by Ubuntu or um, Canonical when they were working on their Ubuntu Touch in order to do that and then I think the Anbox project just became its own thing um, so you could use Anbox um, that's on the phone side of things uh, one thing that I was just saying if it was on the PC or a PC operating system side of things like their, your laptop or your desktop is that store is if they could collaborate with elementary with their elementary store because I think elementary are actually doing quite well with their store as in they have a nice revenue model going on as in um, do you, they're kind of prompting it's quite prompting like do you want to pay for this app and then you have a slider and you can say no uh, I'm uh, on the financial rocks at the moment and I, I can't afford it but I might donate later or that kind of thing and 
uh, maybe if you donate don't donate or don't pay for it that time and um, if there's a major update it'll say you didn't donate this time or last time but you want to throw a developer a fiver or tenner or whatever this time and then for the updates or, or whatever so if they i don't know if they have been approaching the elementary team about um replicating anything like that for um purism but certainly it'll be that'll be an interesting collaboration if they ever do do that i'm uh just skimming through the article on Foronix about this and uh uh they don't mention as far as i can say they don't mention monetization they just say that they want a basically convergent uh App Store uh, with applications that, uh, quote, just works, regardless of which device they are running in. So even the applications will be convergent. So you can run them both on a laptop, and then they do some big 15-inch laptops and uh, a small mobile phone. So they will have to develop that in-house, because as far as I know, there's nothing like that in the Linux world, and necess- not necessarily even anywhere else. Yeah, um, uh, an idea sprung to mind uh, while you were, uh, I think it was when someone was talking about sideloading uh, APKs, um, which would be a great feature, but it actually raises the idea of perhaps, because Purism obviously have a different mission to company, like to uh, Android or Apple, you know, um, so maybe they're a lot more open to this, but like a, a sort of meta app store. So what you could have is a bunch of like independent ecosystems that are, uh, excuse the term, federated. And, uh, so, um, that's, that's the, that's a cool word these days, right? Um, but yeah, no, seriously, they would be, uh, federated. So it would be basically like a, ma- a meta app store, which is, sounds like, uh, uh, kind of sounds like the way forward to me because we can't, you know, we have to kind of, share protocols at some point we all can't keep having things that only work in one place like it's just not it's just not going to work that's actually a very good point i mean we are already seeing uh parts of this when you can have one app store like the gnome uh gnome uh software center or the, the discover store and it has got multiple backends it works with uh whatever your package manager is plus snaps plus flat flat packs as well i think the uh so that uh that's uh already the, the right path i would say uh with the apk side you would have to get them from somewhere uh so maybe a repository like f droid would would work yeah um if we're um all out of out of puff on this topic maybe it's time to move on to the feedback section which Segways quite nicely, considering we were talking about DuckDuckGo. Um, this is another um, alternative to Google search. It's called Quant, I want to believe, uh, which is Q-W-A-N-T. Um, it was suggested by Marcus via email. And I have checked it out, and it actually does uh, look um, quite cool, quite compelling. Um, I think they have a, a beta, which is a music search, so you're able to search music and that sort of thing. They don't... Uh, the, I think they actually have a, a bit of a map search, so they're kind of constantly working on it as well. And I believe they do have a light version, which is the equivalent of your Java, JavaScript free version for your DuckDuckGo, Mike. Yeah, that's one thing that I, since I've started uh, pretty much uh, uh, not full time because I work on something else, but be, at home I mostly use the Pinebook, which is under power, so I switch JavaScript. So the JavaScript v- free version of DuckDuckGo is massively helpful there. And if Quant have got that as well, then I'm definitely going to try it. I like the fact that it's, uh, I think it is, that's the European one, right? Where uh, It's right? French. Yeah. Something In that's, anyway. uh, Yeah, something that's like complies with... Uh, the European Union's uh, or the European view of on privacy and uh, is not necessarily, uh, you know, a tool, a tool that, that takes these things seriously is massively important. And I know that, that Go is uh, uh, that as well, even though they are from the United States. But the more, the merrier here. I definitely agree. The more, the merrier. So um, I think it's time for some uh, 2019 boners. The first, the first boners of the year, on uh, on January sixteenth, is it? No, I think it's. I think you find it's January the eighteenth. Eighteenth. Okay, so it took us eighteen days to get a boner. That's a long erection. But um, I'll start you off there, Connor. What have you? 
Sound like <laughs> so the, yeah, so we won't be releasing this on the eighteenth, but we're recording it on the eighteenth. Um but my first one is actually what we're using right now, which is Simple Note. Um, it was something that I have been com- I've come across to in the past, uh, just haven't used it that often. And then when I started using it, I was like, whoa, this is actually quite useful. And I, I thought it was actually negative in the freedom dimension. I just thought it was something that was kind of simple, easy to use cross platformers and Windows, Mac and Linux. But I think I thought it was all locked up in privacy in, in its own kind of um, proprietary bullshit. I was like, okay, it's a it's a very useful app, um, but I don't know about the back end. And then found out, oh wait, it's on GitHub, so it's actually ne- um, positive in the freedom dimension. And and I think Mike, you discovered there's actually GPL two as well. Um, uh, so. the, the 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 applications definitely. I'm not sure about the the server side, but. Uh that's I'm not sure I don't, I don't actually know uh, yeah I think it's the case with the um, with Telegram as well is Telegram it, the application is GPL3 I believe but the server side is put proprietary yeah I don't know it's possible it's all open source uh, or free software or whatever you want to call it uh, and yeah Wikipedia doesn't have uh, doesn't have the whole uh but uh, basically, no, we don't know at this point whether a simple note is uh, fully open source. There is an API, but we will have the rest inf- of this information for you, dear listeners, in the next episode. <laughs> or, the, yeah, show notes or the next episode. Well, well, oh, uh, yeah, bo- yeah, I can put in the nasals. <laughs> Uh, the um, a bonus one was because I was listening back to our, our Christmas special of the last season is you guys all had boners of the year and I realised that I actually didn't put one in um, so my belated boner of the year for 2018 is actually Steam Play and Proton which is the, that whole thing that was developed by Valve and um, the developers of Wine which are uh, uh, the name escapes me at the moment a crossover, isn't it? Or uh, crossweaver, crossweaver, code, wea- code, code weavers, code weavers. But that's the one we got there eventually. Um, yeah. So my belated um boner of the year for 2018 is Steam Play and Proton, developed by both um Valve and Code Weavers. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, my first erection of the year goes to. Uh, goes to double commander. So since I was switching from KDE to GNOME, and it's, it's, it's not a double contendre. No, it's 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 a commander, not entire. Um, since I was switching to, to GNOME, I thought about switching my favorite tool, which is a double is a dual pane uh, window. Uh, sorry, for dual pane file file man, file manager, and I thought that I will quickly look around and then go back to Crusader because. Uh, Crusader is amazing, and I didn't think I would find anything to match it. And I have to say that so far, Double Commander proved to be uh, pretty much uh, as as good. I'm not fully there with it yet, because there are some workflows and uh, shortcuts that I haven't yet discovered that uh, might be there or might not to fully bring it up to the standard of the Crusader functionality. But it's surprisingly good because I didn't know there were two of uh, two of these tools on such a good level in Linux. I should have thought. I mean, that's the kind of things Linux does very well: uh, dual pane file managers. But uh, yeah, Double Commander is amazing. Excellent, excellent. Um, so uh, my boner is. Um, I should preface this by saying I've been going through a bit of a weird kind of Linux. Re- renaissance or something lately like I've started just going back to basics with a lot of things and not you know not getting too involved in the latest shit so uh, what I've uh, dis- rediscovered recently is GIMP because I started doing um, the uh, thumbnails for the episodes we're putting on YouTube shameless plug and uh, the uh, yeah it's actually it strikes me it's one of those rare Linux programs that's actually quite easy to just pick up and use without really knowing anything about it. Um, everything just kind of makes sense and you can tool tip on everything and you see exactly what it does. Um, the default menus kind of give you whatever you need. Uh, you don't re- you, you have to consult the wiki once in a while, but you know, most things just make sense. So uh, it's pretty cool that you can just pick up and use it. Um, I had some brief 
uh, training in Photoshop like about 11 or 12 years ago when I was in when I was in college the first time and uh, like I had like I don't know like 10 classes or some shit like it was very basic and it was like Photoshop CS2 then it was ages ago so um, yeah but I, I was still able to like map my knowledge from that to GIMP because it was it's actually kind of similar to the old Photoshop what do you guys think? I'm of the uh, of the opinion, just like Mike, when when he's approached with Audacity, is the whole thing of GIMP is like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. There are so many options. There are so many options. There are so many options. For so for you saying it's actually simple and quite intuitive. I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm, like I'm thinking the complete and utter opposite. Um, but then again, I'm I'm not from a design background, so it's probably a bit overwhelming for me. Um. Uh, the any only bit of creative editing I ever do is I my one of my hobbies is photography. Um, I dabble in it occasionally. I'm not saying I do it regularly, like once every couple of months, whenever the the feeling takes me. And so I would do more photo editing, which you can do in GIMP, but it's it's more kind of image manipulation. Um, so uh, GIMP is to Photoshop. Um, uh, kind of like um. Uh, a photo editor like Lightroom would be more suited or the equivalent would be uh, Darktable or uh, what's the KDE equivalent um, Digicam that's the one um, there would be more into photo editing but you can do photo editing in GIMP as well yeah I I am pretty much uh, not that uh, I'm not a photographer and I don't uh, I don't even know what to look for when I edit photos so GIMP for me is just because I can't figure it any other damn way how to resize a picture. I can, I, I know my way around, uh, like, uh, uh, maybe Inkscape better than GIMP because that I can understand. I'm not good at it, but I know what it does. But layers and HDR and, uh, whatever else is there, that's like not my thing. I don't know. I, if you can show me a process photo and a not process photo, and I won't be able to tell you which one is which. So, you know, I, I, I appreciate it is there and I think it's important. I hope to shit that one day somebody will rename it because like, yeah, what is it? It's Gimp. It's going to shoot your balls off. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, it's the GNU image manipulation project or program. Or yeah. Something. It, it is the GNU image manipulation program, but uh, for fuck's sake, come on. I, I'm not usually into branding, but this is bad. This is real bad. Uh, but so I I like uh, whenever I discover like a lit that uh, that one of the easiest things like Gwenview or some other small uh, picture shower can actually also crop a photo. That's enough for me. But I I I am happy that there is game, but that people can use it and to do their work on Linux, obviously. There is Shotwell, and there's a couple of other really simple. Um just photo organizers to do some very basic editing. I think shot well, you can do things like in the background of like adjust your exposure on a, on the kind of, there's a slider and say, Oh, that's overexposed. I'm going to bring it down a bit. And then, yep, yeah, that's fine. Safe. Um, yeah, you see, I already, that's already too much for me because you have to open a project that it wants you to, I don't know if shot well, did you come do that? But it wants to reorganize your photo. I just want to, you know, cut a picture in half or something but no no shotwell is is actually more more simple than you're giving you credit for it's it's not like you open, have to open up a new project is is that those are my photos point at that folder and then the, it displays them all and then as you're going through the the thumbnail like the it'll down at the bottom it's like do you want to ex- adjust the exposure and you can ignore that or or you can click on it if you want or if you want to, or like there'll be options like crop this photo or something like that. It's it's pretty easy to do. Um, I think we're coming up on the hour mark, so uh, I think we should begin wrapping this uh, this baby up. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, we always forget to mention these, so I'll just <laughs> I'll just I'll go through our socials and our contacts and all that. Um, oh yeah, we're that's on, true. Uh, we're on evil Facebook. We're on evil Twitter. We're on evil YouTube now. Um, we're on all the evils. Uh, so. You know, everyone can shout at us on Telegram. Uh, you're right too. It's fine. <laughs> and then, uh, 
And then uh, what what else are we on now? Well, we obviously have the Telegram group, linuxlads.com forward slash Telegram. We are on Mastodon, but it's not very active. We have a, a Matrix chat. It's not active at all, uh, but uh, we can – it's still there. Uh, where else are we? Is there anything else that we are not on? Yeah, I know. It's it's hard to keep track. Yeah, no, essentially we we do set things up as in um Mastodon and Matrix and these sorts of things. Um if you find us there, um have a uh, kind of ping us on it. Um but it's the kind of thing of we will keep wherever our audience is, so depend it's up to you, the audience, to as to what we keep and what we end up um, discarding because nobody's using it. So Telegram yeah. seems, seems to be active enough. Uh, Twitter, I, I seem to get kind of decent interactions on Twitter. So it's, it's Facebook is Facebook is basically just dead. Like nobody really adds us on Facebook. It's 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 that's where the audience is. So it's kind of where we're putting our our episodes out to the most eyes possible even even if our, the interactions of those posts is not the best it's the kind of thing of we're showing or showing ourselves to the masses that kind of thing um i think um mike you're saying you had a couple of good interactions on on mastodon as well so mastodon seems to be quite good yeah i mean it obviously takes a better person than me I mean, I'm, I'm quite anti-social and anti-media so i'm probably not the best person to to talk about <laughs> with, with other people anyway so that's that's our socials our our, our, our contact is uh we're on uh, linuxlads.com is our main web page show at linuxlads.com is our email address if you that's the one i was forgetting Okay, before before the contact section turns into its own discussion topic, I think we should all say goodbye. Um, so uh, thanks for listening, as always. Uh, I've been Shane. I've been I have Mike. been Connor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. And we are the Linux Lads. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.